What does the name Sound Blaster trigger in your brain? For me, it creates an association with Creative Labs and a sound card from the 90s that I wish I could have persuaded my parents to buy for my 486 PC. Sadly, I ended up with a sound card that was Sound Blaster compatible. I don't remember which model exactly, but it was an ESS audio drive. I always wondered if owning the real thing would have made a difference. The Sound Blaster was a game changer. Creative brought a product to the market that offered more features than the sound cards from the market leader Adlib, and it was also a lot cheaper than premium products like the MT32 from Roland. A feature that contributed to the success of Sound Blaster sound cards was that Creative Labs added a game port, which many other cards lacked at the time. Furthermore, the Sound Blaster was fully Adlib compatible. I can't believe that in 2024 I finally hold one of those cards in my hands that I desperately wished for back in the day. A Sound Blaster 2.0. But I didn't buy this card from a classifieds website. Oh no. I was fortunate enough to find it in this pile of scrapped electronics. And while I kept going through this mountain of PCBs, I couldn't believe my luck when I found another Sound Blaster. The same card, but in a different revision. Now I have two Sound Blaster 2.0s, one in revision 3 and the other one in revision 6. So without wasting more time, let's try one of those cards in my 486 setup which currently has an Intel DX266 installed. I can't wait to hear the output of this sound card, something I always wanted to experience. Huh, that doesn't sound right. I heard that those cards are noisy, but not like this. Unfortunately, this is the only output I got from this card. Just a hissing noise. Could it be that this card is defective? Well, good that I have two of those cards. Let's try the other one. And no, we get the same behavior like we did with the first card. The Sound Blaster 2.0 has a few jumpers on the board to configure the address port between 240 and 220. Mine is set to 220. And there are also 4 places to select the IRQ. Mine is set to 5. So I don't think the card is misconfigured. Some of you may already know what is going on, and I hear you ask, what power supply are you using? Does it have the negative 5 volt rail? And I would have to answer, I'm using an ATX power supply from EVGA, which does not have the negative 5 volt power rail. Older AT power supplies delivered this voltage, but it was no longer required on modern systems and was consequently removed in later revisions of the ATX specification. The Sound Blaster 2.0 is one of those rare ISA cards that require negative 5 volts to operate properly. If you do not have this voltage, you will end up with the sounds we have heard so far. Okay, then the Sound Blaster 2.0 is useless when you only have an ATX power supply, right? Oh no, not at all. People from the community already were able to solve this problem. The most famous solution must be the voltage blaster created by Necroware and Phil's computer lab. On Phil's website you will find a brief description of the project including a few sound cards that require the negative 5 volt power rail. Oh, and look at that, the Sound Blaster 2 is mentioned in the list. Luckily, the KiCad project files are available on GitHub. You can export the Gerber files with which you can order the PCBs of the voltage blaster. Of course, PCBWay was kind enough to manufacture the PCBs for me. They are also the sponsor of today's video. Thank you PCBWay for making all this possible. As usual, the PCBs I got were of exceptional quality and the voltage blaster worked as intended after I soldered the required components to the board. After we power on the system, we can measure the negative 5 volts on the 5th pin in the lower row on one of the ISA slots. However, I did notice that there were few drawbacks when using the voltage blaster. Don't get me wrong, the voltage blaster is an amazing device and probably the easiest way to restore the negative 5 volt rail to your ATX power supply. But it is possible to accidentally install the voltage blaster the other way around if you're not paying attention. This will most likely damage your motherboard. Another issue is that the voltage blaster will block one ISA slot. If you only have one, you're out of luck installing another ISA card. And finally, I could see a potential issue where components of the voltage blaster interfere with the expansion card of the adjacent PCI slot. However, that would also be the case for any other ISA expansion card. Luckily, the circuit of the voltage blaster isn't very complex and we could design a different solution. From today, there will be another option to restore the negative 5V rail on ATX power supplies. 
And here is my solution. A small PCB that essentially uses a very similar circuit as found on the voltage blaster. The main difference is that we no longer need to occupy an ISA slot. All through-hole components have been replaced with SMDs. The main component is a linear voltage regulator and two tantalum capacitors, selected as per the datasheet of the regulator. This little PCB can be added to something like this 90 degree ATX adapter. There are properly spaced connection pads that need to connect to negative 12 volts and ground for the voltage regulator to function. The negative 5 volt output also has a pad at the edge of the PCB. All three pads need to connect to their respective ATX power lines below. And then, with the help of this little adapter, you have restored the missing negative 5 volt rail on ATX power supplies, which allows older hardware like the Sound Blaster 2.0 to function properly once more. Before we continue with the sound card, I would like to let you know that from today, you can get this PCB from PCBWay's shared project space, which will make it very easy for you to get those PCBs. I am also working with PCBWay to get everything in place so you can order fully assembled PCBs. We may even be able to get the PCBs attached to the 90 degree ATX adapter for you, but this is not yet confirmed. And while you're browsing PCBWay's website, you should also check out their other services that include 3D printing, CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication and injection molding. Links are in the video description. Now that we sorted the issues with the missing negative 5 volt rail, we can finally go ahead and listen to the Sound Blaster 2.0. At least there is no longer any noise coming from the speakers while the system is booting. I guess this is a good sign. To test this sound card from 1991, I selected 4 games that most likely have been played with the Sound Blaster 2.0. The newest game of those 4 is Doom 2, which was released in 1994. Then there is a Star Wars title with X-Wing, the floppy disk edition, released in 1993. Another first person shooter from 1992 is Wolfenstein 3D. And finally, we will look at The Secrets of Monkey Island, which is the oldest game from 1990. The tests will be short, we just want to get a feeling of the sounds this sound card creates. Let's start with Doom 2. The game has a dedicated configuration utility where you can select from several soundboards. The Sound Blaster 2.0 is not specifically listed. However, it is the last revision of the original Sound Blaster and therefore compatible with the original device. Similar to the original Sound Blaster and the Sound Blaster 1.5, Version 2.0 also uses a single channel 8 bit digital to analog converter, and the output is limited to mono signals only. It takes a bit of time to get used to the controls, but the sound effects are exactly like I remember. Let's move on to X-Wing. Same as in Doom, we have to configure the soundboard before we start the game. The Sound Blaster is once more an option to pick from. Sir, our TIE interceptors have located a rebel fleet orbiting the planet Torkana. Excellent. Prepare the attack. We are under attack by Imperial Star Destroyers. Begin evasive maneuvers. Launch the X-Wing fighters. Unsurprisingly, the in-game sound effects are perfect and exactly as I remember. We have sound effects, voices and the famous iMuse music system. All as it should be. Let's have a look at Wolfenstein 3D. You are greeted by a system summary screen with information about memory configuration, input controls and audio capabilities. The Sound Blaster was detected by the game. Let's see if it works. And once more, everything is perfect. The Sound Blaster just works. Let's move on to the final game. 
the secrets of Monkey Island. And here, things took a turn for the worse. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. It is not by accident that I have chosen this game to be part of the test. This game supports playing sounds via the PC speaker, the onboard Yamaha OPL2 FM synthesizer and the creative music system, also known as CMS, to which we come in a moment. Since the game The Secrets of Monkey Island was released in 1990, chances are very high that many people played it using their PC speakers. I think this was one of the better performances of PC speaker games. Nevertheless, I'm very happy that we have the Sound Blaster 2.0 installed, which outputs a much better theme of The Secrets of Monkey Island. Or so I thought. The issue I faced in this game was that the theme sounded ever so slightly different. Sometimes, notes got stuck from the moment I started the game. And sometimes the playback is not very clear. It sounds like some notes are played as noise only. <laughs> and other times the entire theme just sounds wrong. As if some of the orchestra members suffered from a bad hangover. I spent quite a bit of time trying to understand why. But so far, I couldn't figure out why both Sound Blasters behave so unpredictable and only in the secrets of Monkey Island. I recapped Revision 6 of the card, replaced all jumpers with new ones and cleaned all sockets and socketed ICs with electronic contact cleaner. But nothing seemed to help. By the way, I get the same behavior when using the voltage blaster, so it is not the fault of our new little friend here. Since I couldn't figure out what was wrong with the sound blasters, I decided to try a different sound card to rule out an issue with the game files. This ESS 1688F has an OPL3 clone on board, which does play the intro correctly. So I am at a loss here. I don't know why my sound blasters do not work properly with this game. Maybe you have an idea or know what could be the problem? Are both my OPL2 chips broken? If you have any clue, please let me know in the comments. Now that we heard enough of OPL2 goodness, let's focus on something that is special to the original sound blaster. CMS. The Creative Music System, also known from the Game Blaster, was a proprietary, short-lived innovation from Creative Labs. CMS required three additional chips on the card, but as you can see, both my cards are missing those ICs. Creative decided to ship most Sound Blaster 1.5 and 2.0 without those chips and made them an optional upgrade, in exchange for money of course. Today it is quite hard to find the original chips from that time. Fortunately, there are compatible chips available that can be used to recreate the CMS feature of this iconic card. I ordered mine from AliExpress. Links are of course in the video description. We need three chips, two SAA1099 and one GAL16V8. The two SAA chips can be installed directly, but the GAL chip needs to be programmed. Unfortunately, Creative never released the program code for such a chip. Luckily, there are some really smart people in the retro community and given enough time, a solution to the missing program code of the GAL chip appeared. The first reverse engineered version was only compatible with earlier revisions of the CT1336 bus interface chip. It did not work properly with the CT1336A. As it turns out, the Sound Blaster in revision 3 has a CT1336. That will put us in the position to check the compatibility of the code on both cards with different bus interface chips. The first person who was able to successfully re-implement the logic compatible with both chips was Suntag, who released the code on Vogons in 2019. 
With his code, we can flash GAL chips for any Sound Blaster 2.0, regardless of what version of the bus interface chip is used. I also want to mention Necroware, who was evenly able to reverse engineer the code before Suntag released his code. He was probably the reason why Suntag released his version after all. The secret was lifted and available to everyone. Even though I could have used any version of the code, I will be using Suntag's work today. The GAL chip is a programmable chip that executes logic operations. Those operations, also referred to as equations, can be stored in a simple text file, which then needs to be compiled before they can be written to the chip. Here you can see what Sontag reverse engineered. If you don't understand what is going on here, then you're not alone. Luckily, we don't need to understand it to use it. With the equations file ready, we just need to call the program eqn2jed and give it the equations file as a parameter. The program then compiles the equations into a jed file. And this file needs to be written to the GAL chip. So let's get the chip into my programmer and write the compiled code to it. Before we can try the creative music system, we need to enable it by removing one jumper right next to the GAL chip. The only game that supports CMS from the four games we have seen today is The Secrets of Monkey Island. So how about we try that now? To tell the game it should use CMS, we have to start it with a parameter G. I guess this originates from the original Game Blaster name. And now, the game will play the intro using the creative music system. And here you will hear a major difference. CMS is capable of generating stereo sounds. You get two channels of music output. I highly recommend listening to the intro using headphones to get the full experience of dual channel CMS sounds. Of course, I also upgraded my other Sound Blaster 2.0 with the CMS chips. And I'm happy to let you know that they work beautifully as well. Before we wrap up, I would like to know if you own one of those iconic Sound Blaster cards. Are you missing the CMS chips? Maybe reach out to me, I have quite a few of those chips left over. There are enough for another 18 cards, provided that none of them are defective. Of course, I will program and test them before I figure out how to get them to you. But you can also find links to the chips I ordered from AliExpress in the video description. If you have a programmer, you can easily create the CMS upgrade yourself. And don't forget that you need a power supply with negative 5 volts for the Sound Blaster 2.0. You can use the Voltage Blaster from Necroware and Phil's Computer Lab or have a look at my nameless creation. Whatever voltage mod you go for, I suggest that you use PCBWay to manufacture the PCBs. Thank you once more PCBWay for your support, which makes all this possible. I'm also happy to hear your suggestions on what could be the issue with my misbehaving OPL2 chips in The Secrets of Monkey Island. And finally, I hope you found today's content interesting. If you did, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching and I will see you in one of my other videos.